everybody. Good evening for the European guys. Good night for the Australian and the Japanese. So it's a pleasure to have tonight on the ICOI uh, lecture channel, Dr. John Russo. Dr. John Russo is a periodontist in private practice in Sarasota, Florida. He's a diplomat of the ICOI. He is a past president of the Southern Academy of Periodontology and is serving as a member of the Board of Trustees for the American Academy of Periodontology. Dr. Russo is an assistant clinical professor at Medical University of South Carolina in the Division of Periodontics. He has been uh, the course director for Russo Seminars, uh, Bone and Soft Tissue Hands-On on cadaver since 2003 and he will tell you at the end of his lecture the, the the courses he's offering so his topic today will be dynamic navigation featuring x guide john thank you so much for sharing your experience with our members and we look forward for your fantastic lecture I will be with you at the end of the lecture. The lecture will be about 50 minutes. We will have uh, time for Q&A at the end. Thank you so much, John. The audience is yours. Thank you, Dr. Pelty, for the introduction. Thank you to the ICOI, Alejandro and Tara for setting this up. Um, I'm very excited to be with you today. Dr. Pelty was questioning the background. Um, I live in Sarasota, Florida. I love the fish. And uh, this was a photo I took while I was uh, flats fishing. There were tarpon that were coming across this flat and I took the picture. We did so many Zoom meetings over the last 18 months that I inserted this picture because it's, uh, it's something that's near and dear to my heart and I, I, love, uh, I love fishing. So anyway, I'm coming to you from Sarasota, Florida um, and my topic today is dynamic uh, navigation, uh, specifically uh, guided implant placement. Um, as a disclosure, you're going to see several products from Salvin Dental, X-Guide, Action, BioHorizons, and Adatemp, CM Prosthetics, CareStream, Meisinger. Um, right in the very beginning, I want to make sure that it's perfectly clear that the literature supports that guided surgery, whether it's a static guide or it's dynamic guide, is more accurate than freehand placement. There, there's so much literature to support that. Um, that's what I believe, and we're going to kind of get into the, the nuts and bolts of that as we go. Um, I also need to tell you that I'm on the Board of Trustees for the American Academy of Periodontology, and that this lecture does not necessarily represent the views of the AAP or of the board. I do want to mention the other company who has dynamic guided surgery, and that's Navident Claranav. Um, I watched that company grow the same, almost the same rate as X-Guide. And I think it's a fabulous system. So I don't want to be skewed, you know, just one system. This is a system that I've been using. I was the eighth person in the United States to use it and the first periodontist. So I've been using it for several years. Um, the other system, the Claronap, is actually more suited towards being mobile. So it's a little smaller system. You can put it in the back of your car if you're going from office to office. So there are small uh, differences between the two. But the one I'm going to be focusing on today is X-Guide. Okay, so the outline that we're going to cover in the next 50 minutes is a brief background on dynamic guided surgery. In other words, why do we do it? Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages? Um, X-Clip, X-Mark, we'll talk about advantages. As a periodontist, I think it's important to start to guide soft tissue as soon as possible. And we'll talk about how do we integrate all of this into our practices. My disclosure, um, in my office, I have the X-Mind Trium from Action, which is my cone beam machine. I have a CareStream 3600 intraoral scanner. I use the XNAV dynamic guided surgery. You're gonna see BioHorizons implants and you'll see a NAT attempt. So what is guided surgery? The state of the art of guided surgery, there are two ways to, to do this now. There's dynamic and there's static. So what you see on the photo on the left, Dynamic is really sort of like a GPS guided implant placement. In other words, there's two cameras that would sort of mimic um, satellites 
and they're tracking your car just like a GPS would. Well, there has to be a tracker in, in the car, okay? So that would be the patient tracker, and there also has to be a tracker on the handpiece. The different, the, one of the big differences between dynamic and static, and static guides are great. I use them for years, but there are some limitations to static guides. One of these limitations is if you drill your first pilot drill, you put a guide pin in and you have the patient close and you realize, ah, that's not exactly where I want that implant. With a static guide, it's all or nothing. You're done. You can't change the plan at that point. However, with dynamic navigation, you can go back to the computer, you can tweak the implant, and you can continue guiding that implant placement on the spot. Okay, that's a really big difference. So where are we today with, with um, guided surgery? Um, we're taking cone beam scans that gives us the bone, the anatomy, the teeth, but we also have the ability with software to, to plan the crown, plan the implant, but we can increase our um, accuracy by importing an STL file, which is gonna be from our intraoral scan. So that's gonna be the soft tissue and the teeth in occlusion. Okay, we're gonna talk more about that in just a bit. So we know that this is a static guide with a guide tube, and these are incredibly accurate, way more accurate than freehand. And what you see here is just a spoon inside of the guide tube. These are pretty much system specific. Okay, so for the most part, these are closed systems. In other words, when you order this from the lab, you have to specify what implant system you're using so you have the right spoons and you have the right guide tubes. <clears throat> so static guides are a little more time consuming because you either need to email the scan, the intraoral scan to the lab, or you have to mail the, the impression or the stone model. Um, there's a cost to that. For sure, you will have a decreased surgical space. Okay, that's one of the big differences between dynamic guided surgery and static guides. So with a static guide, you have to account for the height of the soft tissue, and you have to account for the height of the guide tube which is typically about five millimeters. Um, <clears throat> for the most part, you cannot do same day surgery with static guides. I mean, you may be printing your own guides chair side, but either you or your assistant has to uh, print that guide and get it ready. So for the most part, we say that, that printed guides are not really same day, but dynamic could absolutely be same day. <clears throat> okay, why don't we like to freehand? Well, we love to freehand, because it's quick and it seems easier, but it's not nearly as accurate. Okay, this was a case that I had done the bone grafts on in the anterior, in the premaxilla. Patient went out of state, the dentist placed the implants and uh, called me and said, hey, I need to ask you a favor. You need to take this implant out, put another one on the cuspid site. And I said, well, are you sure? You can't use an angled abutment or something? He goes, no, wait till you see it. And when I saw the patient, this is what it looked like. And of course I asked him, did you use a surgical guide? And he said, no. Um, so this happens, and this happens with really experienced surgeons. It, this is one of my cases. There's a thing called parallax, and parallax describes your eye's view to the posterior area of the mouth, and it fools you. When you look at the space between this crown and this crown, the center of that is going to look like this when the center is really here. So I think if you look at your own cases, if you're freehanding, your implant that's going to be distal to teeth is almost always too far back with a cantilever in this area. At least that's how my cases are, because what looks like is a center is usually too far distal. So these two implants got too close together. We nursed them along for several years. And finally, when the bone loss was too bad, we took them out. I grafted it and we came back and we were able to place two more implants, but they were appropriately spaced because we used a surgical guide. Okay, these two implants were placed by a very experienced surgeon. They were never restored. They were referred to me for crown lengthening, but the problem is they're too close together. And this is exactly what I was talking about, the parallax. So your eye sees this and you don't appreciate the distance between the, the distal of the tooth and this implant. They got too close together. And if you plan this case properly and you use a surgical guide, this patient wouldn't be in this situation. All right, I would encourage those of you who are considering getting your credentials through the ICOI to do it. I got my diplomate um, uh, certificate 
25 years ago, probably 20 years ago, 25. And um, it, it was very fulfilling going through that process. When you're doing that, you're going to be asked questions like, what do these acronyms mean? IOS, STL. So IOS um, stands for intraoral scan. This is going to be your ITERO, your MEDIT, your CareStream, uh, the intraoral scanner where you wave the wand around and you get the teeth and the soft tissue. That's going to produce what we call an STL file. STL stands for stereolithography. In other words, it's a 3D, three-dimensional photograph of the teeth and gums. You know, so we're focusing on sort of one arch, but the, the other important part of this is we get to get to get the teeth in occlusion when we scan the patient. And that's very important when we're planning the implant crowns. So the intraoral scan here is replacing what we used to do with impressions and stone casts. Okay, another disadvantage of a static guide <clears throat> is in the posterior areas of the mouth, sometimes we can't get the patient to open wide enough to get the length of the drill through the guide tube, through the tissue to start drilling in the bone. Okay, so this is an example. Um, you know, these drills were 24 millimeters long. Well, you might get away with that in the premaxilla or the anterior mandible, the bicuspids. But when you start getting back by the molars, look at the length of this drill. This is a 24 millimeter length drill. Um, and why does it have to be so long? Because the first five is the, the guide tube. The next three or four is soft tissue. So now you're at eight before you ever start, start to drill through the crest of bone. And if you're gonna place 10 or 12 millimeter implant, you need a long drill. Okay, so you can see how wide the patient has to open in this situation. This is a, a bicuspid site. Okay, so let's talk about full arch cases. So absolutely you can do full arch with static. And for a while, we didn't really have a good way to do a full arch with dynamic, but now we do. And I'm gonna go through that in the, the back third of this presentation. So on this particular patient, we did bilateral sinus lifts and we, we did virtual implant placement on the computer. I designed this, we sent this away to the lab. The lab sort of duplicates the denture and puts all the guide tubes in. We have to tell the lab what implant system we're using so they know what size guide tubes and what, and I have to make sure I have that surgical kit. So this is what it looks like in the patient's mouth. <clears throat> there will be um, pins that will hold this in place. Usually there's three. There's one here, one here, there's one in the midline of the palate. And this was done uh, years ago. And I always thought more is better because if this patient loses one or two or three, we still have the same prosthesis. So that's the advantage of doing multiple implants versus all on X, okay? So this particular system was the anatomage system. Um, this was the first two millimeter pilot drill going through the spoon. And here are the implants placed. When you look at the cross section here, you can see that we were very accurate. It's right in the center of the ridge and we did not go past the limits of the sinus graft. So this was a, um, here are the healing cuffs. You can see this was what we call a spark erosion. And the dentist that I was working with likes to do these. Um, this is still in the patient's mouth. This case is probably 10 years old at this point. Um, and this is what it looks like with the transition line and the uh, lip support. And he was very happy with that case. My point is it, you can do uh, dynamic or excuse me, static guides for full arch cases, but you can also do them with dynamic. All right, so let's talk about the big picture. Using um, dynamic guided surgery, whether there is Claronav, Navident, or XNAP, um, there are going to be a couple of cameras. And, you know, when I first started with this technology, it seemed like the trackers were big and I didn't like it on the handpiece. And when I said to the, the, the engineers of the company, I said, oh, I'm sure this stuff is all going to get a lot smaller in the future. And they said, actually, it's not going to. And I said, why? They said, if you, if you have smaller patterns, your accuracy goes down. This is as small as we can get and maintain the accuracy that we have. Okay, so we, we've got to have this, this size pattern on the patient tracker and the handpiece tracker in order to have the accuracy that we have. And as you're gonna, you're gonna see, this is incredibly accurate. I'm gonna show you where we did our virtual implant placement. Then after the surgery, we took another CAT scan 
and the engineers overlaid the two, and then we can tell we can tell how accurate it is. Okay, so with the XNAV system, we have options. The two options with teeth are what we call an X clip, which is just a fiducial, where it's a thermoplastic clip. You heat it up in a water bath, you snap it on the teeth. It's got to be still; it can't rock. And then there's what we call X mark. So X mark was developed during COVID, and as we were coming out of COVID, they started training people on it. And X mark basically allows you to use a CAT scan that was taken in someone else's office. So if the case is worked up in your office and you know you're going to do dynamic guided surgery, you make the X clip, you put it in the patient's mouth before you take the CAT scan. If you get a patient referral and they walk in with a disc or a thumb drive and they say, here's my CAT scan, I don't want another CAT scan, you're not dead in the water. We now have the ability to register that patient using um, their existing CAT scan. So you don't have to take another scan. Then we get down to the red options. So this is a complete, these are three options for completely edentulous. There's a protocol for ridge reduction, okay? There is a protocol for um, a terminal dentition. When you have a posling edentulous, it's what we call the dual scan technique. And for those of you that are primarily surgeons, the periodontists and the oral surgeons that might be in the group, um, I'm here to tell you as a periodontist, this is 80 to 90% a prosthetic discipline. I mean, you have to be a good surgeon to place these implants and to do the flaps and to do the ridge reduction, but the bulk of this is a prosthetic discipline. Okay, so the dual scan technique we'll get into, that's where you scan the denture with fiducials on it, you put it in the patient's mouth, you scan the patient with the denture in, and then that's how you register the patient's um, jaw to the CAT scan. So you notice here on four and five, we start talking about EDX screws. So the way we used to do this on an edentulous case is we would put um, fixation screws in with little um, small incisions. We could do it, leave them in for the surgery, or we could do them same day, plan the case and place the implants. Now we don't have to do that. We can plan the case. And during the surgery, we place these EDX screws and the EDX screws basically will hold the tracker that normally would be attached to the X clip when the patient has teeth. And this probably all sounds very foreign to you, but uh, let's get through the lecture. And when I have some diagrams and photos and videos, hopefully it's gonna make a lot more sense. This, this uh, slide I made for when we do our course, uh, we always encourage the surgeons, the doctors to bring one or two of their surgical assistants. And the reason is, of these 14 steps, all of the steps in blue, one through 11, should be done by your dental assistant. It's really important that the doctor understands these steps, the importance of the steps, and how you can't skip anything. But really, this is what the assistants do. So as we go through one through 11, um, when I know that we're going to do an implant case, I'll tell my assistants, take the X-clip, take the CAT scan, take the intraoral scan. And then you go all the way down to nine and 10. My assistants will actually import that into the software. They will put the virtual crowns in place and they'll put the virtual implants. They can track out the mandibular canal. So they do all that. And I literally have a whiteboard in my kitchen at the office. So they'll put the name of the patient and they'll say, Dr. Russo has to proof this case. Well, when I see that list and they'll put the date of the surgery, I go back to the machine and I will minimally tweak the crowns and tweak the implants. Now this takes some training for your assistants, but this is time that the doctor does not have to spend importing the information, you know, identifying the nerve and all that sort of thing. So it's very small. I almost always, I, I should say, I always have to tweak the plan a little bit, but once I get the crown and the implant where I want it, then I hit lock on the software. And so if there's any doubt when my assistant pulls it up on the computer, and she sees that it's locked, that means that I'm done. I proofed it. Don't touch it again until the surgery. And then the last three things is what the doctor does. They do the navigation, the system check, and they place the implant. All right, so with this system, we have two trackers. 
we need to know where the patient is, where their jaw is, and we need to know where the handpiece and the drill is. So the, the round cylinder here, this is what we call the patient tracker. There's an arm right here that gets screwed into the patient tracker. So you'll have a right and a left. This is the X clip. So the clip has a thermoplastic part underneath it. These two are sort of one. There are BBs in this. And when you put that thermoplastic clip into a water bath, it, the, that material gets soft and you take it out of the water bath and you mold it on the patient's teeth. And you let it get cool, you stick it in some ice, you snap it back on and make sure that it's reproducible. And then that's what you would take the CAT scan with. This is the handpiece tracker. So yes, this is a little bit big. It's a little bit cumbersome on the backside, but you can't do this accurate without having this pattern. Okay, so this is how the box comes. These are, whether you do one implant or you do 10 implants, you get billed by the case. Okay, so it's roughly $100 per case. And you're, you're sort of paying for this and the ability to use the software. So Big Brother is sort of watching your cases and that's how they know how many cases that you have done uh, and what to bill you for. So the X-Clip patient tracker snaps on the teeth. We've sort of talked about this. There's a tracker arm. Uh, why? So that the cameras know where the patient is in three dimensions. Then the handpiece tracker attaches to the handpiece for the same exact reason. Okay, this is a, uh, a picture of the water bath. We put this in 140 to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the first time that your assistants leave this on with no water in it and it burns up, you will appreciate how much a dental water bath costs versus a, um, a baby fryer from Walmart that does the exact same thing. It's about $29. Okay, so after we burn one of these up, I learned very quickly from my colleagues, let's just use a baby fryer. It does the exact same thing. You put water in it and it's, it's not so painful if you end up burning it up because your assistants forgot to keep water in it or turn it off. Okay, so the assistant puts this in the mouth, they take the CAT scan. And what you have to appreciate is on the CAT scan, these teeth are separated because there's a clip. All right, so when I first started doing my first couple of cases, I was calling the company and I was saying, hey, this thing's not accurate. There's something wrong with the technology. Um, I don't like this. Maybe there's something wrong with my treatment plan, but this just isn't going the way I want. You do your first drill, you put the pin in, you have the patient closed, and you're like, this is way off. There's something wrong. You get behind schedule. You say, forget it. I'm going to freehand this. You freehand it. It's still not right. Uh, and you get frustrated. The problem here is that you don't have any occlusion and you don't know where the soft tissue is to accurately place your crown and your implant. You might get the crown kind of close if you have teeth on either side. It gets more complicated when you're missing two or three teeth in a row. Okay, that's really hard when the teeth are not in occlusion, but also your implant. If you have an abundance of bone, you can place that implant dead center, but dead center is not always the best prosthetic spot for that implant. And that is the ultimate reason why we're doing this. You know, all the literature on uh, cement, uh, getting under the gum line, causing peri-implantitis, how do we avoid that? You know, a lot of my referring doctors are, have for the most part, gone to screw retained restorations. Well, you know, you can't do a screw retained restoration unless the implant is in the ideal prosthetic position. Okay, so all of a sudden, when the restorative doctor says, you know, I wanna do screw retained, now the pressure's on the surgeon to get the implant in the proper site. So this is the difference right here. This is a game changer. I got an intraoral scanner and I started importing the soft tissue and the teeth in occlusion. This makes all the difference in the world. So in the software, you import the DICOM data, which is your cone beam scan with the teeth separated. Then you import your intraoral scan with the teeth in occlusion and you marry them. So now I can see the bone, I can see the soft tissue, I can see the teeth and occlusion. This is a game changer. This makes all the difference in the world. Okay, so that exactly is why it's important to use an intraoral scan. Okay, so this is just a video of taking an intraoral scan. Um, this is the care stream. I mean, any of the scanners, the medic, the 
the uh, Itero, the Trios, they're all good. Um, I think you're going to be better with dynamic navigation if you import the STL file in addition to the DICOM. All right, so here is the uh, X clip. And you know, when you start doing this, your assistant's gonna put the right arm on when it should be to the left. Um, they're gonna make a mistake until, you, until they understand and learn. If you can appreciate, I'm a right-handed surgeon. So if this is my right hand and I'm placing an implant in number eight or number nine, I want this clip on the opposite side of the mouth. If during your training, your very first case, you have the clip on this side, now you're doing your first case, you're not sure what you're doing, you have to work over top of that clip to place an implant in the number 14 or 15 site. That is significantly more difficult. Okay, so on your early learning curve, place it if you're right-handed, place implants on the right, put the clip on the left. Uh, for the eight, nine position, you can put it on either side, but why would you make things more difficult for yourself? So you need to train your assistant to know why you want it on the other side. Um, and it's frustrating when you get in there and they go, oh, we forgot, we weren't thinking. And now you have to work over it when you didn't have to, because it's hard to have that finger rest. Um, so they put those together. Um, and what you see on the left is the pink outline of the tooth. And then you see the blue of uh, the virtual tooth. And then you see the blue outline of the virtual crown. There's the target. You basically put your drill on the target. And instead of looking in the patient's mouth, now you're looking at the computer and you start to drill. And it tracks your drill turn for turn. So this is called a go plate. Um, you know, early on, if you've placed a lot of implants, you're going to find it very difficult to trust the system and look at the computer and not look at the patient's mouth. Um, you need to rely on your assistant to, know, to tell you if the water's not flowing or if something looks weird. But once you calibrate the drill, there's this thing called a system check. And the system check is how you rest assured that the technology is working the way it's supposed to and the accuracy is the way you want. What I wanna point out about this slide is um, whatever implant system you are using, this is what we call an open platform you're not stuck using a certain system. You can use any system that you already have in your office. Um, early on, I think it helps to start with a Linderman burr. A Linderman burr is a side cutting burr. And if you use your regular pilot burr and the ridge is irregular and you start to drill, your drill might start bouncing around and you're gonna have a hard time controlling it. Whereas if you start with a Linderman, because it's side cutting, you can put the burr at an angle, and as you start to go deeper in the bone, you simply upright it and you go to depth. We're gonna talk about burrs a little bit more. Um, so this is the summary. X-clip, put it in the patient's mouth, take the scan, calibrate, plan the case, do your surgery. This was my very first case. So when you purchase the system, uh, you'll get a day or two of training where a trainer comes to your office and they, they will do the hands-on work through with you and your assistants, but then they want you to schedule two or three surgeries where they're looking over your shoulder and helping you with your first couple cases. What I want to point out is this was my very first case. Uh, I listened. It was on the right side. We had the clip on the left. Um, so tooth number five, the, the blue is where I planned the implant. And then we took a CAT scan of the implant right after the surgery, we emailed that to the engineers at XNAV. They overlaid them. And what they found out, I can't see because my, the picture of me, <laughs> let me see, oh, there it is, got it. All right, my global platform position was 0.59 millimeters off. So I was a half a millimeter off. My angular deviation was one degree. When they were going through the FDA uh, with their independent review board studies, they had to be 0.7 and 3 degrees. So my first case, I was more accurate than what the FDA required. So I thought that was a good sign. All right, here's a tip. If any of you are currently using these thermoplastic clips, when the patient has crowns, you're going to get nervous about pulling these clips off, and the patient's going to be nervous about you lifting a bridge up or lifting crowns off. So what we've started doing is placing topical gel inside the thermoplastic clip 
and these clips will snap on and snap off much easier. Okay, another tip is if you have a younger patient where the teeth are not maybe fully erupted, short clinical crowns or something like that, you don't have an undercut for this clip to snap on. You can take some composite, just like you would for um, an Invisalign case, you add it on the buckle, just enough for this to snap over and take off. You can do that before, and then after the surgery, you can remove it. But you don't want that to rock. Okay, this is a video of the tracker registration. So I must be doing the surgery on the right. This is getting snapped in on the left. To make sure it doesn't rock. Check to make sure it's not rocking. So the reason you need two assistants is your second assistant has to adjust the camera. And the cameras have to be between 60 and 80 centimeters yes. from the track. Do you want to guess and zoom in a little? So these cameras have to be between 60 and 80 centimeters from the track. So what you're going to see is, I think you've already done the system check. So on the upper left, you see the drill. I'm going to put it right in the center of the target. Yes. And then we start the drill. So it's going to change colors. And when it turns red, you are at depth. And that's how you know when to start. So let's look at a couple of cases. Um, what I want to point out is I lectured at the American Academy of Periodontology meeting a couple of years ago with George Mandelaris. I was talking about XNAV. He was talking about Clarinav. And we didn't really know what kind of cases each other was going to show. During the lecture, I thought it was very interesting to periodontists, the cases that they thought were most valuable to use dynamic navigation were both anterior cosmetic cases. Okay, he showed a couple, I showed a couple, because as you know, it's either right or it's wrong in the anterior. In the posterior, we can get away with a lot, but in the anterior, you can't. So uh, there wasn't much buccal plate left here. We grafted this. Uh, we did delayed implant placement versus immediate. Uh, this was a papillus bearing incision. And what I'm gonna show you is a sped up version of the treatment planning using the software. So we've imported everything. I'm grabbing the crown number nine. We place it and I'm gonna sort of position it. And what you need to know is the, or the crown library comes from an anatomy textbook. So they're giving you the average of like a hundred people for height, width and length of every single crown. So it's gonna be pretty darn close. You may have to tweak it, and you can tweak it in any of these three dimensions right here, okay, height, width, or length. Um, and then once you get it where you want, then you plan your implant. Okay, so that's pretty close. I want to do this as close to real time as possible because it doesn't take that long. Now I'm doing implant number nine. Replace the implant, and I'm going to rotate it. And I don't want it to come through the incisal edge or the facial. I want it to come through the palatal. Okay, and this is where you have the huge advantage of the intraoral scan with the teeth and occlusion, because you've got to have the crown in the right spot, then you design the implant. Okay, the definition of fully guided means that not only do you prepare the osteotomy guided, but you place the implant itself guided. All right, and the definition of fully guided, according to the FDA, is two thirds depth of the implant. So if you do that guided with your handpiece and the bone is dense, at that point, you can take the handpiece off and you can put a ratchet on and you can finish inserting it. You can technically call that fully guided. Okay, so this is...
a tracker. This is a go plate. Okay, so that's how I'm calibrating the length of the drill. You have to do that for every single drill. The system check, this is how we know that everything is accurate. In the mouth, I look at the incisal edge, then I look at the computer. And if it's not in the exact same spot, there's something wrong. Okay, so we do our drilling. This is that, that same case at number nine. Um, longer drills are better. And I'm gonna talk about the drills in a second. So this is the fully guided implant placement. We're gonna do our calibration. Same thing, system check. And we will uh, place the implant guided. And why do we do that? Because in soft bone, sometimes it's easy to drill the osteotomy, but then when you place the implant, the implant uh, migrates, it drifts. Uh, we're taking an ISQ reading. The ISQ is 75. So if you're comfortable with that reading, anything above 70, you could probably put a temporary crown or a non-functional uh, abutment and crown there. Let me go back to the drills for a second. Um, and this, this kind of gets to the basic literature on guided surgery. The, a short drill is going to have a negligible wobble factor in, your, in the chuck of your handpiece. When you add a short drill with a drill extension, you now have um, included a wobble between the drill and the, and the extension and the extension and the handpiece. So now it's exponentially longer. You're going to have a lot of variation with um, where you're placing your implant. So it's, your accuracy goes down when you start importing different parts. So I would prefer to use, for example, BioHorizons has a short drill and they have a long surgical drill. The long drill will do 95% of my cases. There's another uh, drilling system that, that um, for osteodensification, for expanding bone, their drills are long, okay? They're a good length um, if you choose to use those. And by the way, you don't have to go reverse to use those. You can go clockwise if you use those drills. I would prefer, prefer to use a one piece long drill versus a drill extension just because of the accuracy. Okay, in this particular case, case I did a connective tissue graft from the palate. We're gonna suture that over on the buckle of the implant, uh, advance the flap, and the patient was wearing an Essex retainer. So the question is, well, how accurate was I? Here was the, the plan ahead of time. So you can see on the lower left, the blue outline of the virtual implant. And then you can see the overlay of the actual CAT scan that was taken right after the surgery. I think we nailed that. Okay, I'm very happy with that implant position. And I do have uh, a photo of this patient, but I did not put in the presentation. This crown looks beautiful, okay? Because it was able to be screw retained, and we got it in the right prosthetic position. So my angular deviation was 1.91 degrees off. I would take that any day. Remember the, uh, the um, IRB required it to be three or less. Okay, we're switching gears from X clip to X mark. So what is X mark? It's the ability to use a CAT scan that you did not take with the X clip in the patient's mouth. Okay, I'm not gonna show this video, but if you go to YouTube, you can see this full video telling you everything you want to know about XMARC. Okay, so what is it? It's a fast and easy virtual, here's the key, virtual registration. It uses XGUIDE without the XClip. However, you still need the XClip during the surgery because the cameras have to know where the patient's head is. Um, you're gonna have three virtual touch points. So what that means is you have to find three anatomically reproducible spots. That's going to be a cusp tip. It's going to be a CEJ. It's going to be a corner of a tooth, something that you can see. And this is why it's important when you start doing this, that you have a, a good CAT scan. Okay. Some are better than others. You have to have a good scanner so you can re reproduce these spots. So basically, once you've identified these three spots, um, you'll save them on the software. Then during the surgery, the surgeon will take this X mark probe, put it on the spot, and then your, your uh, non-sterile assistant will click on that spot on the computer and it will register it. Okay, so you calibrate your handpiece in the X mark probe, attach the patient tracker with the X clip, and you use X mark to virtually register the patient. There's a thing called refinement. Let's say you have your three or four spots, what is even better, around the arch, and you wanna start with the, the one that's furthest from the X clip, 
and you're just not sure that that's going to be accurate enough. It's not. So you go back and there's a thing called a refinement. Refinement means just like you would color with a crayon, you would color on paper, you color with your um, Xmark Pro and it's getting hundreds and thousands of points on three different spots in the mouth. That's going to be the most accurate. Okay, most of the time it's not needed. Occasionally it is if you don't have a good scan and you don't have a reproducible point on a cusp tip or a CEJ. So what you need to do XMark is the X-Probe tracker. You need a, you can use a small field of view. So let's say that you got a CAT scan from an endodontist that only has three or four teeth, and you can now use that. Um, CT markers are not necessary, and you do wanna have the patient's teeth slightly separated. There's a thing called surfix algorithm, which is basically a sort of a, a zone around the teeth. And the doctor will identify what they want. And the reason it's colored like this, you've got red, green, and purple, that's gonna to correspond to red, green, and purple in the arch. So you know what slice you're in. Here's the red, the green, the purple. So this is the rainbow, all right? What you wanna do is you wanna crop out all the unwanted anatomy. You do the same as you did with XClip. You do your virtual teeth. So we're doing 18 and 19 with the crowns. Um, you do your virtual implants. While I'm thinking of it, there's a thing called the nudge tool right here. And it's actually, this is wrong. And we found this out during the live surgery. When you do your nudge tool, it's not a half a millimeter, it's 0.25 millimeters. So if I put this virtual implant where I want it, and I go, you know what? It's just not dead center of the crown. I wanna move it a quarter of a millimeter at a time. Well, if you try to do that with your mouse, it's really hard. You put the mouse click down, you move it, and the whole thing moves significantly more than a half a millimeter. With the nudge tool, you've got it in the right angle, but you can move it 0.25 millimeters at a time in north, south, east, or west direction. This is important. Um, for a while, we didn't really have a great way to do an all on four or an all on X case with angled abutments like this. We now do and we actually can um, simulate the abutment trajectory line as well. Okay, the intraoral scan is optional, but whenever possible, I would highly encourage you to use that. If you don't have an intraoral scanner, the old fashioned way is take an impression of the teeth, pour it up as a stone model, put it on foam or on gauze and take a CAT scan of that. Then you import that DICOM as you would an STL file, and it's going to do the same thing. It's going to show you the soft tissue and the teeth. Okay, so again, you've got your X-clip, your tracker arm. Um, you're going to calibrate. So you have to calibrate your handpiece, and this is what your assistants would do. Your X-mark probe. And we also have a, um, a tracker for a straight handpiece. So let's say you wanted to for whatever, you wanted to do a Ramus graft or you wanted to do a, a TAD or something, um, you can use a straight hand piece with the tracker. All right, you touch the go plate that you saw in the video and you navigate. So this is Dr. Emery. He's an oral surgeon. He is the chief medical this officer. This is Dr. Robert Emery demonstrating the use of the X guide. After we measure the length, we touch an adjacent tooth to ensure accuracy of guidance. We collect the tooth using the mouse. Then center the tip of the drill, the blue dot over the target, which indicates ideal position. That's center of the target. As we drill, the depth is indicated by the color. Yellow one until we reach the 45 degree spot on the clock. When we reach the position, it will turn green. The ideal angle is indicated by the top of the color, which is a white circle. We reach that depth, it turns green. I'm going to select the other two, do a quick system check, which only takes seconds. We then center the drill over the as we do now again. We reach the maximum depth and go beyond it. It goes from green, which is the ideal depth, and then it will turn red when we go past the ideal depth, indicating the clock. Okay, so this is important. During the surgery, if you say, you know what, I don't like the position of that, 
unlike a static guide, you can change your position and go right back to the navigation screen. There's no recalibration necessary and you can re-drill. So you can change your plan in the middle if you need to. Um, I'm looking at the clock and we're running a little bit short on time. Um, so let me just give you the overview of the fully edentulous. They require you to do 10 surgeries using an X clip or X mark before you do a fully edentulous case. But um, this is sort of the latest thing that they've come out with. And the people who have had these machines for two and three years are coming back and learning how to do the all on X case. All right, so um, everything this is the same as what you've seen, except there's a, these are the EDX screws, okay, right here. And instead of having an X clip, we put these screws into the patient's jaw with an upper or a lower arm, and here's your patient tracker. You use X mark to mark your spots on the bone to register your patient. And based on where you planned your implant depth, you go back and on the software, you mark the, the top of the implant on the buckle of the bone. And that's where you, what you're gonna do is you're gonna mark those, those dots and you're gonna connect the dots and do your ridge reduction. So this sticks out about eight millimeters from the bone, which gives you the room to do your ridge reduction. Um, so this is just showing how to place the EDX screws. I'm gonna skip these videos. This is sort of the workflow. Um, there are different ways to do this. So I wanna just show you one. This is uh, Stephen Balshi who runs CM Prosthetics in Pennsylvania. He has a monolithic denture that's created ahead of time that's milled. It has um, occlusal stops in the back for the, for the opposing occlusion. It's got holes drilled exactly where the implant abutments are gonna come through and it has a handle in the front. So the first appointment, the dentist takes the cone beam scan, takes the intraoral scan, and if necessary, a dual scan with the fiducial. Um, they email that to the lab. Steven will design the denture. Um, he will do the virtual implant placement based on what you recommend. You have a chance to look at it, tweak anything on the denture, tweak anything with the implants. Once you've signed off and approved it, then Avident will mill this monolithic denture that's two colors, it's pink and it's white with teeth. Don't ask me how they do that, I don't know, but it's, it's one piece of material. And when they send this back to you in the mail, you can do your um, guided implant placement and conversion. Um, the last thing I wanna to talk to you about I'm going, for time's sake, I'm gonna get through this pretty quickly. This is what we call a NAT attempt. So with accurate implant placement, we can place an anatomically correct contoured healing cuff that's two piece that can also be used as a scan body. So there are three dimples on the buckle, two on the lingual, and you get a chart like this and it'll tell you what size to use for what tooth in the mouth. The cost is about the same as a standard um, abutment, healing abutment. So it's good for an internal hex, internal conical hex, and an internal foreside connection. So labs have to import this into their software uh, to be able to design, to design a custom abutment when you send your, in, your uh, intraoral scan of the scan body. So you do need ideal implant placement. If you freehand it and the implant's too close to one tooth or the other, you're not gonna be able to use it. You're gonna to have to use a standard healing cuff. Um, so this is just telling you a little bit more about it. I'll show you a couple of cases. There's the scan body. Okay, on the implant. But you notice these implants are all placed pretty darn accurate. And these are all done with XNAP. So here's the intraoral scan of the, um, of the scan body. So in ExoCAD software, you can create a model. That's what the model looks like with the custom abutment and the crown. And the most important thing is when you look at this photo, this doesn't look like an implant crown. This looks like a crown on a natural tooth because you have the accurate um, emergence profile. All right, so that's what it looks like. This is done with the Vulcan lab uh, from BioHorizons. That's custom milled abutment. 
You notice how nice the soft tissue is. It doesn't look like a standard stock abutment. Okay, um, in conclusion, I wanna thank Dr. Pelty. Um, I wanna make sure that everyone knows that there's a winter meeting in Atlanta, March 17th through the 19th. I had the honor and privilege of speaking there about um, block allografts. So my topic is uh, block allografts as an alternative to autogenous blocks. Um, this is how you can reach me, website. I have a new Instagram account, Russo Seminars, so please check that out. We're gonna be doing an Instagram live in the next couple of weeks, and I'd love to hear from you. And I guess now's a good time, Dr. Pelty, if you have questions. I see some questions. How do you address the issue when you need to place the implant and do bone graft at the same time? John. Well, the, whether you have to graft it or not, the implant placement is the key. If you have enough bone to stabilize the implant, then wherever you plant it virtually, all you're doing is, is the same thing you would do freehand, except it's going to be accurate. So I'm not sure if the question has to do with an edentulous, like uh, uh, EDX screws, but as long as you have something to attach your patient tracker arm, you can do it guided. I, I hope that answers the question. I didn't quite understand the, the grafting part, but the implant's gotta be placed in a certain position, whether it's freehand or guided. It's just wherever, let's just say it's an immediate and you're gonna graft an immediate extraction site, you're gonna do your virtual implant through that route and it's gonna be where you want it to be. So instead of freehanding and worrying about that implant drifting from that hard palatal bone out to the facial, you might still have the drift, but at least you can see it on the computer screen that, that, that your handpiece is, or your implant is drifting and you can force it to go back into the position that you need it to be in. Well, maybe the, the question is meant, you insert your implant with a navigation in the perfect position, even if it's not an immediate placement. And then when you finish the implant position, you can continue to do the grafting and close the flap. Exactly. That will be the, the, the sequency. Adjusting the angulation of the, I wasn't clear on topic of adjusting the angulation of the implant if the original deviation was greater than three. Okay, so the, the, the three degree deviation means that there was something wrong in the system. Okay, if you're, if you're doing this correctly and your system check is accurate, you're gonna be somewhere around that one, one degree. Um, if you put your, if you drill your first uh, pilot burr and you put your guide pin in and you have the patient closed and you look at it and you say, there's something off, there's something way off, you can go back cancel that implant and do your plan again and tweak whatever you need to tweak for your next drill. That, that's what I was trying to talk about. Um, so the, the three degrees that we were talking about is the FDA would never have cleared this technology if unless it was the accuracy was less than three degrees off, or excuse me, more than three degrees off. By the way, for the audience or people who couldn't reach us tonight or this afternoon, you will see this video soon on the ICUI YouTube channel, YouTube slash ICUI Dental. So it will be available for everybody in the future. So, and, and uh, you have Dr. Russo's email. So if you have some other Specific question, I'm sure John will be more than happy to answer them. Or go to the course. If you are interested, I'm sure you, you will learn a lot. And uh, it's also with navigation, it's a learning curve, to be honest. Yeah, we, we, the, the courses are, are really for the doctor and the assistant. It's important to bring the assistant and you'll get to see live surgery each day. The second day is a full arch conversion. So the stuff that we didn't have time to cover in the... In the webinar today, it's a full day dedicated to that with hands-on software and hands-on with the EDX screws and the tracker arms. So I think the people feel pretty good when they leave, comfortable, ready to do it. All right, thank you for having me. Thank everybody. Thank Tara, uh, the whole 
uh, uh, staff who organize those meetings. It's a lot of work behind it. Ale, Tara, Betty, and the whole headquarters. Thank you so much and looking forward to see you in the next webinar. Thank you, John. Thank Have you. Have a wonderful day and enjoy, enjoy the water behind you. <laughs> Will do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.